In the last video, we discussed the location of the brand of sacrifice and how it symbolically represents the purpose of that individual to the Baylet owner's dream. We also talked about how humans created the idea of evil through their search for meaning and how that creates the God Hand through the desire for something greater. In Griffith's case, they desired the king. In Conrad's case, they desired gluttony. In Slan's case, they desired lust and sex. Ubik, they desired artifice, or a deception from reality. And finally, they desired intellect and reason through void. But did they also desire something else? Was there a missing piece of the puzzle that I left out of the equation? Let's explore. Although we don't know all the details of how Void became a God Hand member, we have clues that have given me inspiration to make a speculative hypothesis. Once again. Of course, this video is intended for entertainment purposes and could well be proven wrong if Mira's assistants decide to continue the story. But with that said, let's take a deeper dive. The first assumption we have to make is that Mosgus' story about the Sage in the Conviction Tower is true and that Void was the Sage that was locked up by King Geyseric. If this is true, and Void would eventually become a God Hand member, then the people in the subterranean layers of the Tower of Rebirth were his loyal disciples, who followed him blindly, much like Corcus to Griffith, so they would be saved from Geyseric's tyrannical rule. As a historical comparison to Geyseric, we're going to discuss the fifth emperor of Rome, Nero considered by many history's greatest criminal. In his younger years, Nero killed his younger stepbrother to prevent him from claiming the throne, had his mother assassinated, although she was trying to kill him too, and purportedly started the Great Fire of Rome that lasted for nine days and burnt down roughly 70% of the city, just so he could bypass the Senate and build a new palace called the Domus Aria. Latin for the Golden House. Likewise, Geyser gathered workers from all across the empire to build a large capital city for himself. One could only imagine that it was going to be a lavish estate based on the dilapidated structures at the bottom of the Tower of Rebirth. In the aftermath, people blame Nero for the fire, and there's even a story that he played the fiddle while the fire ravished the city, suggesting that he was an ineffectual leader and cared not for the people's suffering. To deflect blame away from himself, Nero scapegoated the Christians. According to Tacitus, a historian who was in Rome at the time of the burning, although he was just a child at the time, to get rid of the report that he was responsible for the fire that raged through Rome, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. During this epoch in history, Christians were a fringe cult in the Roman Empire, who propagated a most mischievous superstition. Therefore, placing the blame at their feet was a low-risk proposition that worked like a charm for Nero. Christians were thusly persecuted and subjugated to every kind of torture imaginable. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, covered with skins of beast. They were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt, to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Due to their absence of power, Christians had little recourse to exact revenge on the mighty Roman Empire. So the beleaguered Christians wrote the Book of Revelations, also known as the Apocalypse of John, to paint the Roman Empire as wicked and blasphemous. In fact, John used a beast to represent the Roman Emperor and identifies him through the number 666. In Hebrew Gematria, which is an alphanumeric code or cipher, the name Nero Caesar calculates out to 666. And John also believed that Satan had incarnated in the actions of the Roman Empire. So as you can see, because the Christians at the time didn't have any power or sway with the politicians, they had to find a way to exact the revenge on the Roman Empire. So they wrote a book to ameliorate their woes during an arduous epoch in their history, via giving them hope that God would intervene on their behalf, eliminate the forces of evil, and establish a new order for the virtuous to live in God's glory. 
the virtuous being the lambs that believe in the Christian God. I bid thee welcome to this distant setting, this abstract time, ye lambs of the ungodly God born of man. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And with your blood, you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. See the similarities? Much like the Christians during the reign of Nero, so did the sage, i.e. Void, experience every form of torture. He thusly professed the sins of Geyserich's empire, much like John through the book of Revelation, to oppose the master morality, i.e. those who are strong, powerful, or wealthy, via creating a dichotomy between good and evil, to bring the strong down as the wicked creatures, so that the quote-unquote good, pious people may thus elevate themselves. I would even surmise to say that Void was the impetus behind the Holy See itself. Hence the reason that Mosgus is enraptured by his story and is so subservient to the Holy See itself. How much reverence has a noble man for his enemies? And such reverence is a bridge to love, for he desires his enemy for himself. As his mark of distinction, he can endure no other enemy than one in whom there is nothing to despise and very much to honor. In contrast to this, picture the enemy as the man of Rosantamont conceives him. And here precisely is his deed, his creation. He has conceived the evil enemy, the evil one. And this is in fact his basic concept, from which he then evolves as an afterthought, an appendant, a good one, himself. Geyser subscribed to what Nietzsche referred to as a master morality, and sought any and all means to exert his dominance upon the world. Whereas Void, a follower of the slave morality, felt a deep-seated hatred in his heart for the king, because of his exploits and power. But hatred is unbecoming of the priestly caste. So he professed his hatred for Geyserich in the form of love for God. Christianity has sided with all that is weak and base, with all failures. It has made an ideal of whatever contradicts the instinct of the strong life to preserve itself. It has corrupted the reason even of those strongest in spirit by teaching men to consider the supreme values of the spirit as something sinful, as something that leads into error, as temptations. One could even relate this analogy to modern-day sports athletes. Look at Tom Brady, for example, a man who's considered the GOAT by many, including myself. Because of his greatness and good looks and happy life and his ability to exert his strength and creativity onto the world, people naturally hate him because they themselves cannot achieve what he can achieve. So because of this, they have to drag his name through the mud. They have to ridicule him at every opportunity. And by doing so, they thus attempt to elevate themselves. Which brings us back to Berserk. Notice a reoccurring theme with the Baylits. They help disadvantaged people who have no hopes of achieving their dreams. People whose lives are in complete disarray. They are the weak, the helpless, and the desperate. Their desire for power permeates from their hatred toward the quote-unquote injustices of the world. They subscribe to the notion of good and evil giving in to their base emotions, putting on airs like they're godly beings, children of God in Christianity's case, but in actuality, their purported love is really a fissure in their heart in which evil surges. Cut your love asunder. Think about it for one moment. The same people who preach love and peace are also the same people that preach about hell on earth. And this is very reminiscent of Carl Jung's shadow concept. You can't create one frame of mind without creating the opposite. For example, you can't create the kingdom of heaven in your mind without the enantiodromia of hell also being present. This is why people who put on a facade that they're these altruistic people and are just purely nice usually are some of the most vicious people on earth. 
And likewise, some of the more gruff and off-putting individuals sometimes have hearts of gold. You have a shadow within you, your opposite half. And the more you try to avoid it, the more you try to put on a facade that you're something else, the more it grows within you. Hence the reason Christians, by trying to create this idea of heaven, are really creating this idea of hell within themselves. The hell is their hatred. It manifested in the throes of the Roman Empire when they were persecuted. And for Void, this hell manifested when he was subjugated to torture by King Geyseric. The ones who desire vengeance against the quote-unquote wrongdoers are the same ones who are first to inflict pain upon them. Revelations and the Eclipse are the outward projection of one's hate toward their enemies. For one to become a God Hand member, they must harbor an immense amount of vitriol towards the ones that wrong them and have the support of others so that they may sacrifice them to the idea of evil and thus give birth to their demon form, which is a reflection of their own internal psychology. Breaking the fourth wall for a moment, Berserk can be seen as a meta-allegory about the condemnation of religion at large. This is not to say that one cannot or should not be spiritual. Since the path of mages and fairies seems to offer a viable path towards such ends. Now I'll get into this more in a later video, but there's a moment in the manga where Shirka says that mages construct the kingdom of heaven or the sanctuary within their heart. So it's almost a path towards personal knowledge, an individual path, not a group or indoctrinated path, which usually religion offers. So what I believe Miro was attempting to say is that religious doctrine taken at face value obviates one's innermost feelings and the inability to assert their will to power on life. Will to power being one's creative potential an element that is often restricted by political, religious, and social paradigms. By locking oneself into these rigid institutions, one yields to the will of the collective sentiment, and hence disregards their individuality. Berserk in a sense is a fight against what Nietzsche called the herd, which manifested in several variations. For one, the Midland aristocracy, who are slavish in their hatred for Griffith and the Hawk's success. It also manifested in the Holy See's brainwashing of the masses. And finally, it manifests in the hordes of demons who give in to their own fear. We must also acknowledge that Skull Knight, i.e. the shell of King Geyseric, is a victim of slave morality in his endless quest of exacting revenge on Void. One, after all, cannot truly call themselves free if they live for hate and hate alone. The individual has always had to struggle to keep from being overwhelmed by the tribe. If you try it, you will be lonely often, and sometimes frightened. But no price is too high to pay for the privilege of owning oneself. And to wrap up this discussion, we need to address one final issue, something that is critical to the story. Notice when the eclipse was occurring 1000 years ago, that Skull Knight's beloved the Lady Priestess of Cherry Blossoms, had a brand of sacrifice on her shoulder. And we know that a person with the brand of sacrifice were vital to the Apostle or God Hand member's dream. This means that Void was important to the Lady Priestess of Cherry Blossoms. Now why would the brand of sacrifice be on her shoulder? My speculative hypothesis is that usually you have a shoulder angel and a shoulder devil. I think that Void was somehow manipulating the Lady Priestess by talking over her shoulder, by sort of putting ideas in her head about Geyseric and all the ills he was committing in the kingdom. And I think this sort of sowed the seeds of dissension in the Empire. And when Geyseric found out about this, he started torturing the Sage, which then led him to professing his sins to God and culminated in the eclipse. Another idea I had is the popular euphemism, a shoulder to cry on. Maybe because Void was disenfranchised in the kingdom, he used the Lady Priestess as someone to confide in, someone that he could tell all his pains and struggles to, and she was receptive to that. Now, one of my theories in a previous video was that the Lady Priestess of Cherry Blossoms 
was in fact Griffith in a female form. And it would be kind of interesting if this was true because Griffith ended up screwing over the Hawk via betraying them and maybe the Lady Priestess of Cherry Blossoms betrayed Geyseric's trust via allowing the Sage a voice in the kingdom. 